So I was uploading my video yesterday and my comments section blew up. It seems something may have happened. Everybody had to let me know that Oversimplified uploaded a new video. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that times a thousand because I think that's about how many comments I got plus the messages I got on Instagram and even some emails about it and some things on Patreon. Yes, Oversimplified has a new video out. Two new videos, actually. The Punic Wars. So we're going to take a look at part one uh, of the first Punic War today. I'll confess up front, not a subject I know a lot about. If you guys are familiar with the channel, you know that I tend to focus heavily on probably the last 500 years of history. And if you get back further than the Middle Ages, I don't know a lot. So I'm excited to learn today and I'll offer my commentary where I can. We'll try to unsimplify this a little bit, maybe do some research if we need to here and there, but I'm excited to go on this journey with you. As always, the link is in the description to the original content, which you've probably already seen by now. And if you like what you see, please consider subscribing not only to this channel, but check out some of my other channels in the links below, some original content content on those uh, as well as here on this channel and the podcast. Let's dive into the Punic Wars. Oh, Marcellus, you sure have a lot of dignitas. Kiss me. Okay. Um. Mm-hmm. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Hi, son. Just reading the newspaper. What can I do for you? Well, you know how you always say Rome is the greatest civilization in the world? It bloody well is. Well, I was just wondering, what makes us so great? How did we come to be? Wow. My Are we gonna son, get a history of Rome? Boy, let me take you on a journey to this side of the room. The story of Rome begins with these beautiful baby boys going to town on some sheep. Romulus and Remus. Numbers. That's gross. You're gross. Uh, sorry, son. You're not gross. I love you. They're called Romulus and Remus, and when they grew up in 753 BC, they founded Rome. But there was just one problem. They couldn't agree on which of them should be the king, but they worked it out peacefully, right? <laughs> oh, heavens no. Romulus caved Remus's skull in with a shovel. Here's a picture. Our first king committed fratricide? I know. <laughs> Look at his face. And this is going to be setting a bit of a standard, right? I mean, Rome's history, especially the Roman Empire part of history, is filled with this family members killing family members and uh friends killing friends and and that's not unique to rome obviously that's part of history throughout uh power you know uh they say uh absolute power corrupts absolutely and that's what we're gonna see here but um we're getting ahead of ourselves when's the part where we become the greatest civilization dad well you Not see, there yet. At first, Rome was full of men. Oh, yeah. I'm talking like a real sausage party. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. So we invited some neighboring cities over for a big feast, and then we literally kidnapped all of their women. Here's a picture. <laughs> Look at that one. She's like, <laughs> Wow. This is messed up. Then. You're messed up. Ugh. Ugh. Sorry. Sorry. I'll be a better father. I promise. So then, finally... After centuries of monarchy, those tyrannical kings started getting a little too big for their britches. So we overthrew the kings and established Rome as a republic. Is that when all the killing stopped? <laughs> Heavens no. That's when the killing surged, baby. We went wild and conquered the Latin League, the Samnites, the Etruscans. Woo! What a rush. Dad, Rome seems pretty barbaric. You're barbaric! Oh, I forgot to tell you about the time a prophet told Saturn his son would one day overthrow him. So... So Saturn literally ate his own son seconds after he was born. I don't want to see a picture. Here's a picture. Dad, look at that. Hmm? That's messed up, man. Are we really this uncivilized? Hey, hey. If we were so uncivilized, would we use communal toilets where we all fart and poo together in one big stinky, steamy, dirty toilet room? Yeah, Dad, we would. Clean your butt with a sponge, Timulus. But all these guys just used it. What's wrong with your son, bro? I don't want to be Roman. (laughs) I've always wondered about that. And, you know, we have a very different idea of um, privacy today than they did then. Yeah, I mean, they would all sit in that room. I can't even be in a room when there are other people in the room behind closed doors, right? And do that. Um, Different world. Completely different world. Uh, But still, you have to say that just the fact that they have such a setup is advanced compared to a lot of places. Ah, uh, fascinating stuff. This is so weird. You're weird. Uh, sorry, you're not weird. I'm sure you're probably fine. Huh? Ah! 
all that to intro the Punic War. The Roman Republic, a nation that, since its foundation, had been stabbing necks all the way down the Italian peninsula. But this isn't the famous Roman Empire that right. ruled the known world. Not yet anyway. This is a relatively juvenile Rome, still just a regional power. In 264 BC, the big daddy of the Western Mediterranean was Carthage. So let's set the stage here a little bit. This is less than a century after Alexander the Great conquers a lot of what's happening in the East, but he doesn't really push to the West at all. Uh, yeah, Rome is basically a good chunk of what is modern Italy at this point. And you've got Car Carthage, and so you can see, obviously, what's going to be the important part of this, naval power. And this is going to be largely about naval power, this war. Uh, and so, if you're looking at this, it's pretty easy to see where the fighting is going to take place, right? It's Corsica, it's Sicily, it's these islands right in here. I mean, that's where the action is going to take place, and that is what they're going to be basically fighting over. Think about this. 2,000 plus years later, World War II, what do we get to? We get to an allied power that deals with Africa and then is going to invade Italy through where? Through Sicily. Sicily is going to be the key to going up the Italian boot. It's happening that same way, but kind of in reverse. You've got Italy going after Carthage through Sicily. Let's rewind a bit. Carthage was founded in 814 BC, when some Phoenicians in Tyre had a mega surplus of goods and decided to export those goods across the Mediterranean. They became the dominant trading power in the region, and to support their growing trade network, the Phoenicians established a number of colonies, one of which was Carthage. Trade is the driving force behind colonization and exploration for most of human history. Uh, it's about resources, it's about trade, it's about expanding those things, and Carthage is born out of that. Therefore, Carthage began its life as a Phoenician trade colony, and the Carthaginians were actually Phoenicians. Or, if you're a Latin-speaking Roman, they were Punic. Hence the name of the video. Oh. Yep. Over the centuries, Carthage ah. gradually expanded and became the region's base of power. Just like Rome, Carthage was a semi-democratic republic with its own senate and judiciary. But there were also some pretty hefty differences between the two. While Rome was big into farming and stabbing people in the neck, the Carthaginians, on the other hand, just like their Phoenician forefathers, had built their power through trade and navigating the waves. They went here and there, selling ivory tusks, gold, and slaves. And as a result, they were rolling in it. Whenever they weren't busy swimming around in their copious hordes of money, in their spare time, they also possibly enjoyed sacrificing their children to Baal, the god of... Let me just check my notes. Ah, yes. Plant fertility. So Baal, or Baal as he's often referred to, is referred to all throughout the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, that's a god that they've brought with them from uh, their time being Phoenicians. I mean, uh, this was the god that the Philistines worshipped, which Philistine is where we get the modern name Palestine. Uh, so this is a god that has been brought with them from the east. Uh, nothing unusual there. Uh, so yeah, uh, a big difference. But right now we're at that one of those crossroads moments in history, right? We've got two regional powers who are coming up against each other. And if this war or this series of wars, there's three Punic Wars, go a different way, we're not talking about a Roman Empire. Maybe we're talking about a Carthaginian Empire. Uh, and I think one of the main differences, besides the fact that one's kind of grown on trade and one's grown on military power, which obviously is going to set the military power up better for a war, um, is that Rome's, the nature of how they saw their military, I think, was different. Because um, I think the militaries were largely, they largely operated the same as far as fighting on the battlefield. Uh, but Rome's military was set up to be an offensive force, whereas Carthage's military is much more set up to be a defensive force. They were more about defending their homeland. They didn't really use their military in an offensive capacity. Oh boy, these figs aren't looking too hot. Maybe if I throw my son into a burning pit of fire, they'll grow. Have you tried watering them, Dad? Hmm. No, we'll try that second. As a result of all their trading, Carthage had emerged as one of the Mediterranean's superpowers. But wait, they said. Rome? What the heck is that? 
Well, I know it's a pretty obscure little country that you've probably never heard of. But this spunky young nation was about to upset the entire region's balance of power. Initially, the two sides enjoyed relatively friendly relations, and had even signed a couple treaties. But it was a relationship that was practically destined to turn sour. So it says the Greeks smell. So obviously, you know, if we're talking about a time in history where the Greeks have gotten to the height of their power further east, you've got two regional powers, one with, you know, that grows kind of on conquest, one that grows on trade. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why they would want to kind of basically not focus on fighting each other, but focus on kind of mutually defending themselves against Greece. Again, seeing the parallels, things like the build-up to World War I, you've got a huge power in Germany in the center of uh, Europe, and so you have nations like France and Russia who are on either side who say, you know what, on our own, we have no chance against a power like Germany, but together, maybe if Germany knows taking on one of us means taking on both of us, maybe that's enough of a deterrent to keep them from coming after us and so the same kind of thing happening here see rome had a thing where they liked to aggressively expand their boundaries often viewing such expansion as a defensive act kind of like when you kill your neighbor because you knew eventually they would have tried to kill you first meanwhile carthage was extremely protective of its wealthy trade network so if you put a very strategically important island between them well two plus two equals war Tensions rose, and the two sides began viewing each other with increasing disdain. Yeah, so, I mean, if if by nature your nation is about expanding, eventually you're going to run into someone else who by nature is about expanding, and conflict's going to erupt. It's, again, another reason why the 20th century was as bloody as it was, is because you have all of these growing world powers who are competing for a limited amount of land and resources. Eventually, they're going to run up into each other, and they're going to both fight over the same stuff. The hard-working Romans looked across the water at the money-hungry Carthaginians and said, Look at those dishonest crooks. Bet they've never done an honest day's work in their lives. And the Carthaginians looked back and said, Look at those simple-minded brutes. Bet they've never sacrificed a baby in their lives. Yeah! While war between the two superpowers seemed inevitable, the event that finally triggered it was a little unexpected. The whole thing began with a few simple mad lads on a wild night out. And this is the city that later on is going to be known as Messina, which is World War II. This is where the Allies are trying to get to because Messina is right across the, uh, the water from mainland Italy. These mad lads are called the Mamertines. They were Italian mercenaries employed by the tyrant of Syracuse, here. But when he died, his successor said, Sorry, fellas, we don't need any big burly men with sharp sticks anymore. You can all go home. Aww. The Mamertines, as it turned out, didn't want to go home. So instead, they went to the nearby town of Messana and said, Hey man, we are but poor little buff boys without a home. May we come in? Aw, poor fellas. Sure thing. Ah, ah. Just so long as you promise not to massacre all of us. <laughs> we promise. The Mamertines then massacred all of them. Well, not all of them, just the men. And they stole their homes and families. Ha! This is my house now. This is my best dad ever mug now. And you guys are my new family. Son, wanna go play catch with your old papa? He's You're not my real- He's playing Among Us on the computer. Real dad? Ugh. Teenagers. Am I right, dear? You're not my real dear. husband. Ugh, I'm so trapped in this marriage. Then get out! No. Masana was now controlled by the Mamertines, and they began raiding up and down the Syracuse coastline. When the new ruler of Syracuse saw this, he wasn't happy. The Syracusans began fighting back, and in response, the Mamertines said, Oh crap, they're fighting back? What do we do? Quick! We'll convince the Carthaginians to come and save us. Oh no! We're in trouble. And we need a big, strong empire to come and rub our bellies. Why are you saying it like that? If I was a big, strong empire, I think I'd like to be seduced. Oh. See? 
It's working! The Carthaginians had long dreamed of controlling all of Sicily. They had been fighting Syracuse and their Greek influence on the island for centuries. And now, here was a great opportunity to get one over on them. So Carthage promptly answered the Mamertines' cry for help and sent a force to garrison Messana. As it turned out, however, some within the ranks of the Mamertines weren't too happy with the occupying Carthaginians, and they sent out a second cry for help to Rome. Again, boy, I see the parallels here. Think about it. If you are a small power surrounded by big ones, you're going to kind of get to pick, right? I mean, you're going to try to get one of them on your side or the other, uh, and you're going to kind of become the proxy through which these world powers are going to go at each other. Think Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, places that we've seen in the 20th century where proxy wars have happened. Uh, it's happened on the African continent. It's happened in Central America. When it reached the Roman Senate, they were a little more hesitant. Going to help the Mamertines ran the risk of triggering an all-out war with Carthage. Yep. And they had only just finished conquering the Italian peninsula, so they were kind of tired. Plus, the Mamertines were all the way across the water. They had never made a leap like that before. So you would assume that to avoid any Need conflict Navy. with Carthage, the exhausted Romans would probably sit this one out. But you would assume wrong. Rome just couldn't resist a good chance for war. Why? Well, there's something you gotta understand about Rome. See, as a republic, they were hell-bent on preventing any one man from ever gaining too much power. And so rather than having one leader, Rome had two, called consuls, who shared power. These consuls could also only serve for one year at a time before new consuls were elected. These measures to limit the powers of the consuls were noble, but had an interesting side effect. The consuls knew they had just one year to try and gain as much glory and prestige as possible, something that was very important in Roman society. And the best way of gaining glory and prestige? Military victory, of course. The Roman political system basically ended up encouraging these consuls to go out and be as aggressive as your Italian. So, yeah, I mean, everything he just explained explains a lot about why Rome is so aggressively constantly expanding throughout its history uh, until you get to the time of the emperors. And, of course, then they're still expanding, but it's for a different reason and there's different motivations for it at that point but uh and a lot of the same things that are happening at this point in history two three hundred years down the road when we get to people like julius caesar and mark antony and octavian uh it's going to be the same stuff that's going on then with the same roles that are involved in grandmother when you don't eat all this spaghetti and so the glory seeking consuls convinced the people to vote in favor of going to messana and in they went Upon the arrival of the Romans, the Carthaginians in the city, amongst the confusion, were forced to leave. Now, in contrast to Roman aggression, the Carthaginian military had a slightly different philosophy. All right, kids, listen up. If you want to grow up to be Carthaginian military leaders, there's a few things you have to understand. If you fail to succeed on the battlefield, that's a crucifixion. Showing cowardice, that's a crucifixion. Hello, sir. What, what are you doing here? Aren't you meant to be in Messana? Yeah, but the Romans showed up. So you just left? Sure did. Oh, you better believe that's a crucifixion. The Roman consuls were awarded for victory and therefore tended to be aggressive go-getters. By contrast, the Carthaginian generals were brutally punished for failure. And so they tended to be more cautious and restrained. So here we have the difference in how you motivate people, right? One is about rewarding success and the other is about punishing failure. Rewarding success is going to breed a different kind of leadership than uh, acting out of fear. I think acting out of fear leads you to be more cautious. It leads you to m take less chances. Uh, whereas the, the possibility of success, if I just take a chance... Uh, it, it allows for those kinds of things to be different. So there's a motivation here. And like I said earlier, there's also a difference in how they operate, whereas Rome is prepared much more to be an offensive force with the way they, they build their legions. Uh, the only requirement, I think, as far as Carthaginian soldiers was uh, that you had to serve to defend your homeland. Uh, there was no obligation for military service to be an aggressive fighting force. This dynamic is helpful for understanding some of the crazy things that happened during the Punic Wars. 
So, the Romans have crossed over to Messana, and now there was some red on the island. Hit that panic button. This turn of events was unacceptable to both Carthage and Syracuse, so the traditional enemies teamed up to kick the Romans off their island. They surrounded the city and said, Hey, you jerks, this isn't your island. Come out of there at once. Okay, we're coming. See, Phil, you just gotta speak with authority. That's what being an alpha male's all about. Hey, man. Uh, <laughs> oh, you, you brought your weapons and armor? No, I, I didn't mean... Oh, crap. Out the Roman legions came to engage the Carthaginians in battle, and they sent them packing. With the Battle of Messana, whether intended or not, by going to help the Mamertines, the two sides had just slipped into an all-out war. And this is, my understanding, one of the longest wars of the ancient time period. It goes on for a couple of decades, um, heavily naval-influenced uh, it's going to see a lot of Greek triremes, things like that. With the initial Roman victory, towns across Sicily, including Syracuse, began switching allegiance because being a winner is more fun. But the Carthaginians weren't about to just give up that easily. In 262 BC, they began building up their forces at Agrigentum. So the Romans, being aggressive go-getters, aggressively go-got them. The Romans immediately laid siege, hoping to starve out the Carthaginian garrison. However, because this was the first time Rome had been fighting outside the Italian peninsula, across the water, they struggled to supply their forces. And before long, the Romans were as starving as the Carthaginians they were besieging. An army can only fight as far as you can take it with supplies. Uh, supply determines so many wars. There's so many times that the ability to supply your army means more than how good you fight. It means more than how well equipped you are. It means more than the size of your army. Uh, if you can't feed them, if you can't supply them, it doesn't much matter what else you're good at. They had to forage for food, leaving them open to ambush. And when Carthaginian reinforcements arrived, creating a double siege, things got really bad. Everybody starved each other for months until nobody could take it anymore. And they all finally came out for battle, which Rome won. Here's the report from the recent siege at Agrigentum, sir. We killed 30,000 while only suffering 7,000 losses? That's amazing! We're the best! <laughs> yes, sir. Whoops, those are the wrong way around. What? We lost 30,000? We're the worst! I want to see what the, the numbers were as far as how many soldiers were actually involved in this fight. So I've been looking at a couple of different sources here, and uh, this this one is kind of a website that deals with Roman history. It's got a lot of detail about the nature of this conflict and what all happened and how many men were involved. Um, but basically, there's a lot of different numbers, as is always the case with uh, ancient Roman history. Um, but the estimates are that the Romans had anywhere from forty to a hundred thousand uh, that were involved here. Uh, and Carthage has similar numbers, 30 to 50,000 infantry, 1,500 to 6,000 cavalry. Uh, and the estimates could be as low as 15,000 for the casualties as far as the dead go for the Romans. And about half that to maybe a fourth of that uh, for the Carthaginians. So definitely, no matter how you look at it, it was bad for the Romans. But we won, right? Yes, sir. But we also got our asses kicked. Yes, sir. So are we the best or the worst? Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> the Romans won at Agrigentum because they were aggressive go-getters, and they now began eyeing up the possibility of conquering the entire island. But they also suffered very heavy losses, and it was clear they couldn't sustain a campaign if they couldn't supply their troops. Here's the issue. Sicily was an island. Islands are surrounded by water. A strong Navy. Navy would be vital for supplying troops and winning the war. Here was Carthage's Navy, and here was Rome's. I think you can see the problem. Historians debate just how much naval experience Rome had at this point. Presumably, they must have had something to defend their shoreline. But whatever it was, it would have paled in comparison to the Carthaginian juggernaut. And that makes total sense. Compare Carthage to a power like the British Empire. How did the British Empire sustain a massive empire all over the world where they had resources and they were dealing with a lot of trade? 
a navy. If you're a trading power on the Mediterranean, you need a navy, not only to be able to carry the goods, but you also have to be able to protect the ships carrying those goods. So by nature, Carthage has to be a strong naval power. And so Rome had to figure out exactly what to do about all this water. Come on, men. We're not going to let some pansy candy ass water get in the way of our glorious victory against Carthage. Charge! <laughs> Tell my kids, I love them. We're going to need a bigger boat. What? Little Jaws reference there, but also an important reference to the fact that most Roman infantry wore pretty heavy armor. And so, yeah, you're going to sink in the water. It's a boat. I don't know. If the Romans wanted to win this war and obtain Sicily, there was only one thing for them to do. I guess we're just going to have to go ahead and build ourselves a war fleet, aren't we? From scratch? From scratch. But we don't even know how. Never mind how to fight with one. Don't worry, Hank. We're up to the challenge. Come on, guys. We're Romans. There's a worm. And Romans aren't afraid of anything. <laughs> and so, the Romans worked long and hard trying to figure out how on earth you actually build the latest style of warship. In the end, they had a bit of luck on their side. A Carthaginian quinquirin ended up accidentally grounding on Italian soil. Oh. The Romans found it and copied the design. This is cool because uh, basically what you have is you have an, a ship falling into enemy hands and they steal the technology. You know, I think of times in history where stuff like this happened where, um, you know, or even in fictional history where you've got things like the hunt for Red October where the Americans get their hands on the latest Soviet technology and they're going to be able to tear it apart and learn everything about it. Uh, you don't want the enemy to get your technology if it's technology they don't have because you don't want them to learn and be able to do the same thing. While the new fleet was being built, the Romans trained rowers on land. And would you believe it? The Romans put together a full fighting fleet of 120 warships in just two months. Wow. A staggering feat. Now, They're I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified. If the Romans can build a war fleet from scratch in two months, then why does it take you half a year to make a video? <laughs> well, my valued subscriber, I think you should shut up. What the heck? That's how awesome. on earth did the Romans learn how to build a war fleet? This shouldn't be happening. From what I hear, they copied the design from us, sir. Well, how on earth did they get the blueprint, Carl? I, I don't know, sir, but I'll tell you what. If you're worried about people stealing your data, no. And Nord you want to protect yourself from outside threats. Don't you dare. Then you, my friend. If you mention NordVPN, I'll scream. Should use NordVPN. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Oversimplified is already making the money off of this video as it is, so I don't feel any obligation to watch their ad. Thank you. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. The siege at Aggregentum, supply issues, and building a war fleet. So now the Romans have a navy, and it's time to put it to the test. But how does one wage ancient naval warfare? Easy. All of the ships had giant bronze rams on the front, so all you had to do was outmaneuver the enemy and give him the jimmies. Easy as pie. And so the aggressive Romans set out for some good old-fashioned jimmy giving. The consul, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, set out for the town of Lipara, believing the garrison there wanted to join the Romans. As he entered the harbor, however, he found himself trapped by a Carthaginian fleet. And now here's your problem. It's one thing to build a navy, it's another to know how to use it. You can't steal the plans or get your hands on tactics. This, is, this comes with experience and leadership. Uh, and this is something I would think that they're gonna have an edge on, but again, Leadership and experience and tactics are one part of it, but uh, aggressiveness and fighting spirit is also a part of this. And, and if one side's much braver and willing to take chances and the other side's not, that, that counts for a lot. And in the following skirmish, he was completely outmatched. The Romans may have had a brand new fleet, but when it came to engaging in actual combat, their inexperience showed. Yep. There was just something better about the Carthaginian ships. The Carthaginian rowers had nicer abs. The entire Carthaginian empire had been built on expert seamanship. Mm -hmm. So when it came to water, the Carthaginians were better and the Romans were wetter. 
In their initial skirmish, the Romans were beaten so badly that the consul, Scipio, was given a nickname, Asina. And if you're wondering what that means, just drop the Ina. <laughs> so what were the Romans to do? How could they possibly stand up to this Carthaginian superpower? Well, there's something you gotta understand about the Romans. Back when they found that Carthaginian ship and copied its design, that wasn't a one-off thing. Copying their enemies was as Roman yeah. as punishing murderers by sewing them into a leather pouch with a monkey, snake, and rooster, and then throwing them into a river, which is a thing they did. Wait, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, copying their enemies. Many of the most famous Roman inventions were actually borrowed. Aqueducts, chariot racing, their gods. Even in warfare, the Romans would get pierced by a Sabine javelin, and they'd be like, wow. They'd get hacked to bits by an Iberian sword, and they'd be like, Wow! And they'd copy the designs for themselves. And and this is this shows intelligence. This shows uh, this is actually something to credit the Romans. You know, sometimes some cultures have this idea: we are better. Anything we do is better. Anything you do is bad and stupid, and we're not going to you know, ever adopt that. The Romans were always willing to recognize when other people did something better and assimilate that into their culture. It's one of the reasons they grew. It's one of the reasons they could be as successful as they were, is that they were willing to learn from other people's strengths. So this is going to be another example of that, I guess. However, they wouldn't just copy it. They would advance it, finding mm, ways to adapt it, it as perfectly as possible. And in the case of naval warfare, the Romans realized if they wanted to beat the Carthaginians at their own game, they would have to adapt. The Romans excelled at combat on land, not on water. But what if, they said, we could somehow turn a sea battle into a land battle? There you go. Sounds crazy, right? Well, they made a couple of tweaks to their warship and... Look, here they come again. They must love getting their asses kicked. Uh, sir, what's that toll thing sticking out of their ships? <laughs> gonna board you. <laughs> they really are idiots. Look at that thing. That'll make them blow over. I mean, look at... <laughs> Bob! <laughs> Bob! Get, get your camera out. <laughs> Take a picture of it. I mean, how stupid can you be? Let's just add a big wooden tower to our ship that'll weigh us down and blow us over in the wind. <laughs> I mean, what does that thing even do? <laughs> yep. Brilliant. The had built a big swinging spiked gangway called the Corvus. So when the Carthaginian ships approached to ram them, the Romans would just slam them. The Carthaginians tried going around no problem. The Corvus could swivel. Try going behind, the Romans would huddle to the coastline. So this is what happens in warfare, whether it's ancient warfare or it's modern warfare, is that during wartime, there's huge advances in technology because you're adapting, you're learning. What happens during World War I? Well, trench warfare is not working. We're losing all these men. Artillery is not doing the job. Let's invent a tank. Let's start using that. What happens in World War II? Well, it starts out with battleships. Well, battleships aren't the thing anymore because now we've got planes. So, so aircraft carriers are going to be what matters. Radar is going to matter. You know, building bigger and stronger bombs that can penetrate armor and can penetrate fortified positions are going to matter. Developing things like flamethrowers to get at the guys that are in uh, bunkers and things like that. Technology is going to grow and tactics are going to grow based on what your enemy does. Okay, he did that. Now we've got to adjust for that. We've got to try and come up with a new plan to neutralize what they've come up with. It was foolproof. Those big, sexy Carthaginian rowing muscles could flex all they want, but they were no match for the Roman mind. So ladies, you see, what really matters is what's on the inside. Please go out with me. And with that, the Romans, who had only just recently began dabbling in the art of naval combat, thanks to their ingenious Corvus, had just managed to outclass the Mediterranean seafaring superpower. The Carthaginians were stunned, and the general in charge of the defeated Carthaginian fleet? Well, you better believe that's a crucifixion. 
With their newfound control of the seas, the Romans could now more easily blockade coastal cities and supply their legions on land. Surely, the Romans were now free to unleash their aggression all over the island. Ha ha! Hey Carthaginians, what are you gonna do now that we're free to rampage across the island? We're gonna go inside these walls and close this gate. Oh, come on guys, stop messing around. Come out so we can kill you. No. Oh, come on. No. Oh, no. To counter the new Roman supremacy, the Carthaginians decided to engage in a defensive war of attrition, forcing the Romans to engage in siege after lengthy siege. The war in Sicily became a long, hard, back and forth slug. One by one, cities slowly fell as the Romans gained ground. Occasionally, the Carthaginians countered and even pushed them back, only for the Romans to rebound again. And whenever a city did finally fall, the Romans could delight in slaughtering the entire population and selling any survivors into slavery, which was pretty standard procedure at the time. Yeah. In general, the campaign on land was progressing much slower than the Romans had hoped, and quite frankly, they were getting sick of it. So in 256 BC, they decided that something had to change. Hey everyone, my name's Marcus Attilius Regulus, and I'll be one of your consuls for this year. Look, as I'm sure you all know, Sicily's being a bit of a drag. Sure, I could go and spend my entire year as consul besieging one single city, but they'll never make a naked statue of me for that. So here's the new plan. I'm gonna skip Sicily entirely, take my army, and go right for the heart of Carthage itself. Well, again, taking chances. You got one year as consul. You got to do something big. Like he said, I'm not going to waste it besieging one city. I'm going for glory. And so they're willing to take chances because of the, the possibility of reward. And that's just not a motivation that Carthage has. I'll slaughter the men, enslave all the women and children. And when I return, you'll all build a thousand naked statues of me. Uh, Marcus, that woman and children stuff, that seems pretty evil and barbaric. No, Jim, it's perfectly normal in the ancient world. Sometimes we even chop their pets in half. Okay, guys, looks like the Romans are coming straight for us this time. And what will they do when they get here? They'll kill us all. They'll massacre each and every last one of us. They may even chop our pets in half. That's barbaric! No, Rob, it's actually pretty normal for the time. We'd do the same to them. Who'll protect us? Funny you should ask, Mary. That's kind of why I called this meeting. Who will protect us? Protect our families, our homes, our children. You guys, ha, don't make me laugh. Why, you're just a bunch of stupid and weak farmers, simple-minded buffoons, cowards. So Fools. inspiring. Rob here thinks enslaving women and children is barbaric. You're a snowflake, Rob. Yes, you are. The fact is, if the Romans manage to land on African soil, we're all gonna die. A terrifying, hideous, unspeakably painful death. Is that the end of that speech? Yes. <laughs> Panic. The Carthaginians had to stop the Romans from ever landing in Africa because they believed that would be the end. So as the Romans were building an invasion fleet, the size of which the world had never seen before, the Carthaginians were preparing an even bigger one to stop them. And in 256 BC, as the Roman invasion fleet made its way south, the stage was set for a humongous battle that saw 680 warships, wow. around 300,000 men, wow. fighting to decide the course of the war. Think about those numbers in terms of, I mean, what was the population of the world at that time? Let's look it up. Okay, so obviously we, there's no way we can possibly know for sure what the world population was. But around 200 BC, the estimates are anywhere from 150 to 230 million people. So these are massive numbers. In terms of world population, to put this in perspective a little bit, uh, let's do a little bit of calculations. So that's the equivalent of something like 15 million people being involved in a naval battle today. This is a massive, massive battle 
for 256 BC. To this day, the Battle of Cape Egnomus remains possibly the largest naval battle in human history, all the way back in ancient times. In terms of the number of people involved, obviously in terms of, you know, there's a lot of different ways you calculate something like the largest battle. You know, is it based on tonnage of ships? Is it based on number of ships involved? Is it based on the number of people involved? So the next time your granddad tells you about the time he sank a Japanese aircraft carrier, Kick him in the nuts. The Romans had a lot riding on this battle. No, they weren't just don't sending their that. warships, but transports as well, full of supplies and horses for their invasion of Africa. They therefore formed a protective wedge-like formation to punch through the long, thin Carthaginian line. Again, let's just recognize how amazing it is that we have this kind of detail uh, as far as the information goes about what happened. Now, most of our sources on this stuff are going to come from Roman writers who obviously are going to put a Roman spin on this and make their side look good, make the other side look bad, probably inflate the numbers for the Carthaginians and deflate the numbers for the Romans as far as strength involved to make it look like it was a bigger deal. So as with anything that we study in history, we have to consider our sources, what's their motivation, who are they biased toward or against? How close to these events are they writing? Uh, and I'm kind of curious to know who it is that, that we have this information from. The Carthaginian generals, however, desperate to prevent the Romans from reaching Africa, had a plan of their own. As the Roman fleet approached, the Carthaginian center feigned a retreat, luring the Romans in so their outstretched flanks could envelop them and get around the Roman corvus. A clever plan. But with such a huge battle and so many ships crowded together, the Carthaginians struggled to maneuver as hoped. And in the chaos, three separate battles emerged mm. across the huge battle space. With the number of ships limiting their ability to maneuver, the Carthaginians became sitting ducks and all the Romans had to do was start swinging. The Roman center came out on top and were then able to turn around and rescue their pinned down flanks. The battle of Cape Egnomus was a Roman wow. victory. Amazing stuff. I'm learning a lot. I hope you guys are too. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I'm going to throw up some links, some other videos you can check out. Once I record part two, that link will be up as well, and you can check that out. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, thank you, Oversimplified, for great content that entertains but also educates in the process. So I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you again soon.